They were a strong herd. Stronger than they had ever been. Strong. Because of him. Their leader. But he did not start out this way. His story began with tragedy. It began when he and his sister were only a few weeks old. They ran and played around the adults, and when they grew tired, they went to drink. When he had lowered his head to the river and drank next to his sister is when the attack happened. From beneath the murky water, a crocodile had been waiting, and his sister just happened to be closer. In the blink of an eye, it burst out of the water, grabbed her in its jaws, and pulled her screaming into the river. He had frozen, scared dead still. But even if he had have been able to react, there was nothing he could have done to save her. The reptile pulled her under, and he never saw her again. When he finally realized what had happened, his herd shepherded him away from the water's edge and moved away. That was the day he learned never to drink alone at large rivers. That experience activated something in him, a need to protect the herd, a need to learn everything he could in order to make sure that what happened to his sister was never repeated. The next lesson came a few days later, when they were traveling through the thick forest. So thick, in fact, they didn't see that this Blattosaurus only meters away. When it broke cover and attacked one of the adults, the predator broke its neck in one bite. The paralyzed body collapsed in front of him and caused the herd to scatter. It took hours for the herd to regroup, and when they did, he had learned to avoid the dense forests. But he was just a juvenile, with no influence on the herd, so he had to watch mistakes be repeated time and time again. He did learn many things from the adults, however. Which food was safe to eat, which food you could only have a small amount of or risk getting sick. What was edible at different times and at different places, where all the sources of waters were. How to look out for one another, and when it was safe to sleep. But he never stopped learning, and as he grew, he had more responsibility for those younger than him. Soon he would be able to protect them all. But one day, when he was taking care of the youngest of the herd, he turned his head for a few seconds, and that was enough to lose one. In that moment, a dromaeosaur had leapt out of the ferns and snatched up one of the youngsters in its claws, and fled back into the undergrowth. That was the day he learned to keep the young between the adults at all times. Finally, he reached full size, he challenged the herd leader for the right to lead. It was a hard fight, but in the end, he was victorious, and usurped the old male of his title. Now he could lead his herd, and he put forth everything he had learned into protecting them. The young were always in the center of the herd, surrounded by the adults, and if they strayed too far, they would all move to bring them back to safety. They never drank from water that wasn't clear, or deep enough to hide a predator. They kept to open areas so that if a predator wanted to hunt them, they would be seen much earlier. When all herds got together to migrate, they would stick to the middle so his herd would be safer. Sentries were always on alert, whether they were eating or sleeping. There were casualties. There were always going to be, but far less than they used to be. And after years of leading, his work was realized. His herd numbers had swelled, and the health overall had improved. It had been harder on them, taking longer routes, staying active for longer, but they were at their strongest in living memory. In fact, the strongest they had ever been. He made sure to pass his knowledge on to his young as best he could, as they would continue to benefit long after his time was up. And that day had come. He had been usurped not that long ago by one of his sons, but his son had learned well from him, continued to do what he did, and he kept everyone safe. Only then, knowing their future was secure, did the memories begin to fade. Perhaps he had finally made up for not protecting his sister. 
Perhaps it was okay for him to trust again. Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down a dinosaur that has been requested by a number of viewers, Corythosaurus. Corythosaurus was originally discovered in 1911. The holotype was almost complete, missing only parts of the tail and the forelimb. Since then, many fossils have been found, from juveniles to adults, giving scientists plenty of material to understand this species. It lived between 77 and 75 million years ago in the late Cretaceous, and has been found in Canada, Alberta, and Montana. It belonged to the Lambriasaurine clade of the Hadrosaur family, and there are two subspecies, Causarius and Intermetus. It grew up to 9 meters long, 3.5 meters tall, and weighed around 3.8 tons, one of the largest of its family. The name Corythosaurus means helmet lizard, referring to the skull resembling ancient Greek Corythian helmets. Over 20 skulls have been found from all age groups, and they show that the juveniles didn't start to grow their signature crests till they were half the size of the adults, and that males likely had the larger crests. Much of the crest was full of hollow chambers that would have allowed the animal to create many different and loud vocalizations, such as for warning for predators and communication over long distances. In addition to this, they had well-developed hearing. In fact, it may have been the strongest of their senses. The teeth were similar to other hadrosaurs, a hard beak at the front to break or strip vegetation, and hundreds of teeth in the back. These so-called batteries of teeth would grind down any plants the animal ate to make it easier for digestion. One fossil show what the animal had in its gut upon death. The stomach contents include conifer needles, seeds, twigs, and fruits. This shows that Corythosaurus had a wide and varied diet and did not specialize like other families of dinosaur. It was once thought that Corythosaurus was a low browser, but that would have put it in competition with other herbivores it lived alongside, like ceratopsians and ankylosaurs. But like most hadrosaurs, Corythosaurus likely fed at many heights, but mostly browsing. This would have been aided by its ability to rear up on its hind legs to reach higher than most other herbivores. All of the herbivores it lived alongside could therefore coexist without directly competing with each other, and hadrosaurs, like Corythosaurus, thrive by not specialising. Scleral rings on the eyes have been fossilised on some individuals, and are most comparable to animals that live a cathmeral lifestyle. These are animals that are active for short periods throughout the day and night. This may also be part of coexisting with other dinosaurs, different species being active at different parts of the day, so that they didn't compete with each other for space and the like. Some species that lived alongside include Centrosaurus, Parasaurolophus, Edmontonia, and Gorgosaurus. Incredibly, skin impressions have also been found, showing it having multiple types of scales across its body. Corythosaurus is one of the more well-known hadrosaurs, at least the ones that sport large headwear, that no doubt would have filled their time period with many different honks, cries, and songs. They are a great example that you don't need large weapons or thick armour to survive in the time of the dinosaurs, though being large does help. But what do you think of Corythosaurus? Do you believe it should get just as much attention as its close relative Parasaurolophus? Or do you lump it in as a more plain hadrosaur? What lesser known dinosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until next time, thank you for watching.